Hi, this is Pastor Manny Gonzalez. Thank you for joining me for this week's on study. We're going into John chapter 16. We're going to go ahead and complete the rest of this chapter. Let's go ahead and start with prayer first. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for our time um, tonight, Lord, as we delve into your word. Again, we ask that your Holy Spirit will teach us, show us, guide us, Lord, uh, what it is that you would want us to um, learn to, um, through your uh, precious words, Lord. And we ask that through this process, Lord, that you would help us to grow, Lord, in the knowledge and grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. We thank you. We're excited. We want to delve into this, Lord. This is an awesome passage of Scripture, like all of them are, Lord, <laughs> to be honest. So we thank you for our time. We ask that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we left off about our relationship with the world. And we saw the reality that if you are a follower of Christ, you will be hated by the world. In fact, uh, if you are a child of God, our life is just not compatible with the world. If you are a Christian, we are just not compatible with the world. And we are to expect opposition from the world because of our commitment to Jesus because we are simply followers of God. We just think differently. We, we behave differently. We do things differently. In this study, we will continue to see how the Holy Spirit will help us to live in a world that is hostile towards us. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you will be hated. But the Holy Spirit will help us through such opposition from the world. Furthermore, we have the overcomer himself who is alive. And that's Jesus, for he has overcome the world, thus making us overcomers of the world as well. The, the title of this message is simply the spirit, our joy and our overcomer, because it's through him that we will find our joy and our peace as well. So John chapter 16, beginning with verse five through 11. But now I go away with I go away to him who who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Jesus noticed that sorrow has set in with his disciples because the topic of his departure had come up again in their own way. I mean, both even Peter in John chapter 13, verse 36 and 37 and Thomas in John chapter 14, verse 5, asked a similar question about where Jesus was going. And the word sorrow, as used here, conveys a state of unhappiness marked by regret, sadness, a state of mental pain and anxiety. I mean, the idea of Jesus leaving them was starting to sink in. But Jesus told them that there was, however, an advantage for him to leave and to return back to heaven. If he physically stayed and continued with his earthly ministry, it would be limited, it would be localized. But when he sends, or when the Father sends the Holy Spirit in his place, then his work will continue to go on, but not locally, it would be globalized. It would be throughout the whole world. In fact, in Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus would later say, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The arrival of the Holy Spirit will take them to places beyond Jerusalem. And really what it is is taking the gospel message of Jesus beyond Jerusalem that would later reach throughout the world. And with the arrival of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin righteousness and judgment. Why sin? It is the very thing that separates humanity from their holy creator God. Sin also keeps can keep sinners from believing in Jesus. Also when sin entered into the picture, it placed the sinner 
<clears throat> as the center of their existence, displacing God from the center of their existence. But the Holy Spirit comes along and convicts sinners that they are guilty before a righteous and holy God. And if a sinner do not believe the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the Spirit is there to point sinners to the truth of who Jesus is. Once the sinner realizes in the court of God's righteousness that they are guilty of sin, the Holy Spirit will then point the sinner of their need of a Savior who can deliver them of their sin. Though the Spirit convicts, notice this, though He convicts, He is also gracious in pointing sinners to Jesus as the answer to their sinfulness. Now, why righteousness? Because the Holy Spirit will show that it is God's uh, standard by which we are judged by, His righteousness. If truth be told, <clears throat> it is by God's standard of righteousness that we fall away, that we are short, that we fall way short of His righteousness. Our very best is nothing but what the Scripture says, menstrual rags. When it says filthy rags, that's what He's equivalent, uh, equating that to, menstrual lags, rags. It's stated in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. And you know what? <clears throat> this is a correct estimation of humanity's righteousness compared to God's righteousness. But notice this absolute wonder and blessing. It is the righteousness of Christ that will allow sinners to gain access to the Father once a sinner is clothed in Christ's righteousness when they repent of their sin and after God has declared them righteous. That, that, that's, that's found in, in, just read Romans chapter 3, 4, and 5. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Why judgment? Because the Spirit will show judgment is reserved for Jesus because of His standard of righteousness. The prince of this world is Satan. The prince of this world, Satan, is a liar. As stated back in John chapter 8, verse 44. And during this time, as Jesus was speaking with his disciples, Satan had no idea, however, of the judgment and the defeat he was going to face at the cross of Calvary, where Jesus became victorious over Satan, the world, sin, and death. And those who do not heed the prompting of the Holy Spirit to salvation through the gospel message of Jesus will be judged for their unbelief. In the end, when it is all said and done, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to point unbelievers, is to point the unsaved, all sinners, to Jesus. And if they reject Jesus for salvation, it will not be the fault of the Holy Spirit for not doing enough. Not at all. You will be condemned to hell if you chose not to heed the prompting, the moving of the Holy Spirit, and for rejecting Jesus for your salvation. In John chapter 3, verse 18, Jesus said, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. By rejecting Jesus for salvation is to condemn yourself to eternal punishment. No one, absolutely no one, will have an excuse when they stand before Christ, the righteous judge, and say they did not know nothing or anything about or can claim that they never heard of His saving grace, the gift of salvation. Because of the love of the Father, He will make sure all sinners were given ample opportunity to repent from their sin and ask Jesus into their heart for salvation through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Through the testimony of the Christian, the Christians God has brought your way, the parents or the grandparents have been praying for you, through your co-workers, when you visit a church twice a year on Christmas and Easter, a podcast, maybe a YouTube YouTube channel you came across that spoke about Jesus and the free gift of salvation. Maybe it was a book, an article, a movie, or there's something, 
I mean, the list goes on and on and how God was getting your attention only because he loves you and wants to save you from yourself because of sin. When it comes to a person's, a person's eternal soul, the Father is serious in having in saving you through his Son, Jesus Christ. But if you ignore the Spirit's prompting and reject Jesus, the Scripture is clear. As I stated back in John chapter 3, verse 18, you condemn yourself. Here's the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 4 says, <clears throat> Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's desire, the desires who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Also in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's an important uh, part there. Not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. God desires not that a few get chosen to be saved or that, you know, God, you know, that, um, that a select few not perish. That, that's not the gospel. He wants everyone, that is all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And he is not wanting that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. That's the gospel. God does not just pick here and there and then choose others to damnation or anything. That, that's not the gospel. Here's the gospel, everyone, all, to be saved. That's what he wants. This is his desire to come to the knowledge of the truth. And he is not wanting that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Again, that's the gospel, that the Father wants everyone made in his image, receive the gift of salvation through his Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 12 through 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what, what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father are, has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. <clears throat> Jesus had more spiritual truths to share, but they would have to wait for now. Maybe Jesus felt that they could not bear any more news because of the, uh, of the sorrow that they were all feeling, so he wanted to wait after his death and resurrection. But nevertheless, in these four verses, what was important for Jesus to share more of was about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit himself will lead Jesus' disciples into further truth and understanding of Jesus' work here on earth. The Spirit was not to come with His own agenda, but to further advance the ministry this side, the ministry of Jesus, this side of heaven, through His followers, though. How awesome is that? Now, at this time, the disciples only understood partially what Jesus had shared. But remember what I said, uh, I think I said last week, if we were really, um, tr uh, if we really thought about the book of Acts, you know, it says the, 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 the Acts of the Apostles and all, but the truth is, is that it, it could be also named the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the lives of His followers, through the lives of Jesus, His disciples, apostles, or His followers. And we get to play in that, which I think is really awesome. But for the time being, you know, they only partially understood what Jesus was sharing. But after Jesus returned back to heaven, and the arrival of the Holy Spirit sent by the Father here on earth, it was the Spirit's work to bring to light all the truth, what Jesus said, and what His death and resurrection means that ties into the gospel message of Jesus to a world hostile to Him, unknowingly, who are, are in desperate need of Him. One commentary says, this points up the interdependence of the persons of the Trinity. 
the Father would tell the Spirit what to teach the apostles about the Son. So again, we see the persons of the Holy Spirit, I mean, of the, of the Holy Trinity here, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, working in tandem with one another in one accord with human involvement, which is cool, humbling, and amazing. But nevertheless, the chief role of the Holy Spirit is to magnify the person of Jesus so that his followers may be filled with the knowledge and grace of Jesus and to reach out to a hostile world as the Spirit brings glory to Jesus. What is extraordinary as his followers, today we get to play a part in serving in God's kingdom along with the Spirit. And it He's been doing that for over 2,000 years, and we get to be a part of that. How cool is that? <clears throat> Verse 16 through 24. A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us, A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, you will see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. Now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. And he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a, a little while and you will not see me? And again, a little while and you will see me? Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy, will turn into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. Verse 22, therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day, you will ask me, uh, you will ask me nothing, but assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Jesus, sharing his burial and reappearance and his eventual return to the Father in heaven, did not compute you know, with his disciples. They spoke among themselves asking, what's this? A little while here and a little while there. We're going to see him now. We're not going to see him later. You know, all these kind of things. And, you know, and then I was go I'm going back to the Father. You know, he, they got all these questions are swimming around their, their minds, around their hearts. Knowing that his disciples wanted to ask him these questions, Jesus, alluding to his coming death on the cross, had shared that they will go through a moment of sorrow while the world rejoices over his death but their sorrow will only be for a moment for it will turn to joy when they see him again after the resurrection and jesus used the birthing process as an example to explain <clears throat> what they are going to experience here shortly what was about to happen in the next hours even days to come such as you know um Judas um, was Judas' betrayal, Jesus' arrest, uh, his disciples deserting him, Peter denying him, the bogus trial and, this, and, and suffering he would endure for, from the religious establishment, standing before Pontius Pilate, plus the humiliation of hanging on the cross, death and birth will be like giving birth. That whole process, the whole thing that they, they, they're going to endure, what they're going to see, what they're going to experience, that is like them giving birth what they were about to experience in the coming hours and even the days were going to be painful and was going to be full of sorrow. But when he resurrects from the dead, hallelujah, all their sorrow and mourning will turn to joy like a mother who holds her baby after the grueling hours of giving birth is done. The teacher they thought they were losing was going to return to them once again. In verse 23, the words, and, and in that day you will ask me nothing, can mean his resurrection from the dead will be the 
that self-evidential proof of what he has been telling them all these past three years. However, and that day can also mean his ascension because once Jesus physically returns back to the Father, they will not be able to ask him anything in person, physically in person. But with the Spirit's help, they will be able to ask anything of the Father in Jesus' name, which was going to be a new experience that they have never experienced before. And this will require faith on their part. But when they ask the Father anything in Jesus' name, it will be joyous. For he said, asking, using my name, and you will receive, and you will have abundant joy. Prayer and joy, they go together, especially when you ask according to God's will and his character, and especially when he answers your prayers. What is extraordinary about Jesus' disciple hearing this for the first time is that Jesus was making it clear that there is a new relationship that he was that was being created through him. In fact, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 through 23 is pl pretty plain about this. Hebrews 10 verse 19 through 23 says, "Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Love verse 22. That's the focus. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That is the blessing that we have in Christ Jesus as, as a follower of Christ. Access to God is now direct with no need of a human priest, which was the customary thing to do back then. You know, you wanted, you wanted someone to intervene for you on behalf, on behalf of you to God and all, you went to a priest. We don't have to do that anymore. What is cool is that we become the priest who have been given access, who have been granted access to God the Father directly, in Jesus' name, who is now our high priest. Again, all this points to a new relationship they will have with God as they remain here on earth and he returns back to heaven. Jesus knew the new arrangement will bring abundant joy to all his followers, which we now experience with our new relationship with God as his children. Verse 25 through 28. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come to the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. In his wisdom and, and, and purposes, during his earthly ministry, Jesus spoke in parables and in figurative language. He also shared some hard sayings that were at times were hard to grasp, to comprehend. Even the meanings of some of his signs, sayings, teachings were at times brought misunderstanding to his listeners. But he told his disciple for this, from this time on, he will speak as plainly as he can about the Father. The word time is the same as hour. However, this hour is not about his coming death, but about his followers having access. Followers of Jesus having access to the Father directly. During their time together, Jesus would ask the Father on their behalf. But after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, there was to be a new arrangement. As I said before, through on Jesus, they will be able to go directly to the Father and ask Him anything in His name. Again, as I said a moment ago, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 23 is about our relationship, our bond 
an arrangement of our access to the Father. It's like an employee waiting outside, you know, wanting to talk to their boss and they're waiting outside for like two hours and all. Then they notice this one person goes directly to the door and has direct access in. And then they come to find out later on, you know, why that person did not need an appointment, did not need to wait, that had direct access only to find out that the person that went in was one of the boss's kids, one of the boss's child. And you know what? It's the same for us. That's us. A born again child of God goes directly to the Father. It's one of the blessings that we have of being a child of God is that now we have access to the Father. And why is that important? I mean, think about it. This is ultimately about humanity's reconciliation with God the Father, which was only made through His Son, Jesus Christ. It's, it started all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, to the point where Jesus is going to sacrifice Himself on our behalf. It's all about us sinners being reconciled back to the Father. It's as if all that Jesus was saying to his disciples and all that he has done here on earth before in the unsaved world is that his end game, if we could use that term, his end game is for humanity to be reconciled back to the Father. This is all about Jesus pointing humanity to God. Look, the first mention of God in saving humanity is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 which pointed people to Jesus. Moses, speaking of the coming prophet of the Messiah, pointed people to Jesus. The Old Testament prophets in their writings pointed people to Jesus. John the Baptist pointed people to uh, Jesus. Jesus' miracles and everything it pointed back to him that he was sent from the Father. But Jesus used all these testimonies and proof about himself to point people to God, to point sinners to God the Father. And now the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to continue to point people to Jesus who gives uh, saved sinners access to the Father. How, it, it's, this is awesome, okay? And if you're still wondering why this is such a big deal, it's because the Father's love for you and for me. Verse 27, for the Father, loved, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from, um, from God. And these words were spoken to his disciples, but these are words spoken for all of us today, for Jesus the future disciples and followers today throughout the whole world. God loves um, humanity, and he wants to save humanity. Again, for God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, it all stems from God's love for humanity uh, and doing all these things through his son, Jesus Christ. In verse 28, uh, just as he left uh, heaven to do the Father's will, Jesus will return um, back to heaven, completing the Father's will. Verse 29 through 33, his disciples said to him, See now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered them, do you not believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I absolutely love the disciples' response to Jesus. They were letting out like a, a sigh of relief here. I mean, reading for the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, says, look, now you're speaking plainly and not using any figurative language. <laughs> I, you know, they, they sound excited. Jesus, you're speaking our earthly language, you know? At least to me, it sounds funny. Anyway, they have complete confidence in Jesus, even though they did not understand fully, okay, at least at the moment, not everything. As, as far as they were concerned, this was enough for them to believe that Jesus was indeed sent um, from God. But then Jesus hits the brakes on their excitement, this self-assurance. They may act like they believe right now, but in a few short hours, everything was going to change for them. For they will first have their faith rocked before it can be solidified. They will look after their own preservation and abandon 
Jesus shortly. But Jesus told them their momentary faithless act will not keep him alone, for the Father will be with him. And this is extraordinary coming from Jesus, because even though they walked with him and he called them their friends, Jesus was fully aware of their shortcomings. But their shortcomings will only be for a moment. Have you ever experienced in, you know, in your Christian walk your own shortcomings with Jesus? You walk with this confidence of self-assurance only to fail him again, again, and again? How thankful we are to have a friend and Savior who understands our shortcomings and is ready to forgive us and to encourage us to continue to live this new life that is in Him where we are encouraged to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Jesus was preparing them of the challenges that was to come, saying, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. His words were so amazing, for in the hours and before uh, um, the end of the, 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 the next day was done. Jesus was going, as I stated before, he was going to endure Judas's betrayal, the, uh, his arrest by the religious elites. Um, the disciples were going to be scattered. They're going to desert him. Um, Peter's denials, the mocking, the whipping, the spinning, the accusation. The crowds who chanted, who, who cried out er, days earlier, Hosanna and the highest, the king of Israel, would now cry, crucify him. And it was at this moment Jesus gave them the words of peace and comforts to his disciples. His, here is his amazing grace on full display, proving to us today that he is our great encourager. Jesus promised them that they will have tribulation from this hostile world, but he offered them his peace that will help them to endure such tribulation. Peace, true peace, is found in him. But as he closes his great discourse to his disciples, which he started back in John chapter 14, the greatest promise, or at least one of the greatest promises that he can offer, was that they were to be of good cheer when they experienced tribulation. Why? Because he has overcome the world. Jesus was proclaiming to them before, beforehand the truth of his coming victory, that uh, they get to share in. And that word overcome in the Greek is nikao, where we get the um, familiar word and brand name Nike, which means victory or to be victorious or to conquer. And the word overcome gives the sense of victory even before the crucifixion. It is the only use of this battle term. I love that. It's a battle term in the gospel. It's the only one used in all of four gospel, although it's used a number of times in 1 John, but it's the only um, time it's used as a battle term in the gospel where the stress is on winning the victory against both the evil one, which be Satan, and the inauthentic ways of the world. And we today are to live by this same victory in Christ Jesus. Being a disciple of Christ comes at a cost, but Jesus as our overcomer, is the peace we need knowing He is our strength, making us overcomers of this world as well. So in closing, what has become known as the great discourse from John chapter 14 through John chapter 16, Jesus told His 11 remaining disciples in John chapter 14, verse 1, He began with these words, Let not your heart be troubled. What, what comforting words, huh? Let not your heart be troubled. Here's another way of translating this word. These words, do not let your hearts be overcome with turmoil. Amen? As I said last week, as long as we remain attached to the vine who is Christ, as stated back in John chapter 15, 1 through 11, we can withstand the wind of opposition from the world and experience the joy of the Lord regardless of what the world throws at us because we have Jesus who has overcome the world. We are a people who have the help of the Holy Spirit guiding us and teaching us 
how to live in this hostile world and to be a witness to this world. To put it another way, we live knowing Jesus has overcome the world, who he is, who is the peace that we need, and from that peace produces the joy that will help us endure the hardships and life's circumstances this side of heaven. Amen. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for sending us the help of the Holy Spirit. We thank you through the Holy Spirit and through your son, Jesus Christ, that you turn our sorrows and our tribulations to joy. And we thank you again for your son, who is our overcomer. And because of that, we too overcome this world. But Lord, help us also to be a people, Lord, that love as you love those who are yet unsaved. So help us, Lord, to be a witness, to be a living epistle, to be a living testimony, Lord, of the love of Christ, Lord, so that they too, Lord, may know about your love, Heavenly Father, and that your desire to save them, Lord. So they, they too, Lord, will come into your kingdom, repent, and receive your son Jesus as Lord and Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you. Thank you for joining me uh, for this week. Next week, uh, join us for chapter 17. It's, it's one of the most intimate, one of the most powerful um, words uh, recorded uh, from Jesus and it's come to be known as um, Jesus. It's become to know, I think, is the the high priestly prayer, and it's 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 powerful. In fact, I encourage you to read it now before uh, we meet next week. Until next time, thank you again for joining, and blessings to you all. Bye.